Good evening, and thank you for uh, joining us uh, from this area and also from Asia. Uh, this is our third uh, event uh, in a series uh, celebrating uh, 40th anniversary of our center, uh, Walter Schoenstein uh, Asia Pacific uh, Research Center. I'm Kyuk Shin, uh, director of APAC, the home of uh, the Asia Health Policy Program, the host of today's panel. Uh, as you may know, uh, we founded our center in 1983 to be a stamp of the hub uh, for addressing uh, critical issues affecting the countries of Asia, their regional and global affairs, and U.S.-Asia relations. So our center uh, originated from the vision of a group of Stanford scholars committed to strengthening U.S.-Asia ties. Okay, throughout our first decade, a period marked by the rise of Japan uh, as an economic superpower and the early years of China's opening uh, to the world, we operated as a forum uh, dedicated to research on Northeast Asia. By 1992, as Asia was becoming the fastest growing area in the world, we renamed the center and broadened uh, it's scope to encompass uh, trends that cut across the entire Asia Pacific region. Okay, one key project we launched uh, at the time uh, focused on competitive uh, health issues uh, in the region, laying the ground for our current Asia Health Palace program. So today, uh, Asia Health Palace program is one of uh, six uh, research programs advance our mission uh, at the center. So I think in my view, there are three uh, objectives. So one is uh, research, conducting uh, cutting uh, edge research on critical issues uh, affecting Asia and Asia-US relations. The second one, uh, education, uh, nurturing the next generation of Asian experts. The third one, uh, outreach or uh, engagement, uh, you know, in Asians and Asian uh, institutions. So throughout uh, this quarter and next quarter, uh, we are celebrating our center's accomplishments uh, with a special event uh, series. So titled uh, Asia in 2030, uh, APAC at 40, uh, this series uh, spotlights uh, selected aspects of uh, our core areas of uh, expertise, uh, examines uh, Asia's uh, changes over the last uh, four decades and uh, considers the drivers and shapers of the region's future. So we already had uh, two events, uh, one by Japan program, uh, the second by uh, China program uh, in last week. And we are going to do a few more uh, besides uh, today's event. And then in mid-May, uh, we will be uh, celebrating uh, in a centers uh, in, a, in, a, in a celebration uh, here at Stanford. So Asia Health Policy Program has always been a supporting home uh, for emerging Asia Health Policy researchers. And today's panel spotlight the fantastic work some of our alum, alumni are doing uh, around the world. I'm really happy to see you know, many of you uh, today uh, on the screen. And I still have you know, fond memory of uh, meeting you uh, during your stay uh, here at the center. So I want to thank uh, program director, uh, Dr. Karen Eggleston uh, for her leadership and many contributions to APAC. And thanks for joining us uh, from her sabbatical actually in, in Korea right now. So please uh, visit our website uh, for more information on other cities uh, of celebration. And I wish us all a you know, stimulating evening uh, you know, today. So without further ado, uh, let me turn the virtual stage to Karen uh, for her remarks and uh, introduction of our panelists. So thank you again uh, for joining us. Thank you so much, Kiwuk, and welcome everybody to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Karen Eggleston, uh, Director of the Asia Health Policy Program, and in honor of APARC's 40th anniversary, I am delighted to be able to introduce five of our outstanding previous fellows of the program. We will have the opportunity to hear from them directly about their educational journeys and their time at APARC and how they're creating evidence to inform important policy in the region. 
Um, so I will provide just brief introductions to them um, and in the order that they were at Stanford and in which they will speak with us today. So uh, first, uh, Brian Chun, who um, has a JD and a PhD. Uh, he is an associate professor at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. He brings with him a global perspective on health and well-being, having lived and worked in health-related capacities in Taiwan, Japan, and France, as well as the U.S. Dr. Chun received his JD from Stanford Law School and his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley and was a fellow with the City Park 2009 to 2011. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Dr. Sien Yi, who is a medical doctor and PhD. He is an infectious disease epidemiologist by training, and he received his PhD from the School of International Health of the University of Tokyo in Japan in 2010. He is an assistant professor and director of the Integrated Research Program at the School of Public Health at the National University of Singapore. Uh, and he also serves as director of the Kana Center for Population Health Research in Cambodia and is adjunct associate professor at Trove University in California. He was a postdoc fellow with us in 2011-2012. Um, and next, we're also delighted to welcome back Margaret Triana, who has a PhD in economics. Dr. Triana is a senior economist at the World Bank's Office of the Chief Economist, South Asia region. Her main research areas uh, examine human capital formation over the life cycle, with an emphasis on how policies and environmental factors affect different dimensions of human capital in low and middle income countries, as well as distributional impacts of environmental risks and policies, which of course also have important implications for health. Uh, Maggie was with us at APARC in 2013-14. Um, next, we have Dr. Fifu Dinza, who is a Burmese national, is a medical doctor, epidemiologist and health systems researcher currently working as a lecturer in the School of Public Health at the Li Keqing Faculty of Medicine, the University of Hong Kong. She's also a member of the steering committee of the Science in Exile Initiative, which we will hear more about from her hopefully. Her research interests are equity, health and education policies, Southeast Asia health systems and policies, and many others. She was here at APARC with us in 2014-15. And last but certainly not least, we welcome back Dr. Vasan Lahabanit from Thailand. Uh, he is a medical doctor with an interest in quality improvement and program evaluation. Uh, he is a preventive medicine physician concentrating in non-communicable diseases and serves as chief of data management and cost evaluating center at King Chulalongkorn Memorial Hospital in Thailand. He was a visiting scholar with us at the Asia Health Policy Program in the autumn of 2019. So we're delighted to have all of you with us. I thought um, we get started with the first round of questions. Um, we'll get into the details of your work and research in a minute, but first, uh, please give us a brief synopsis of your career. What drew you to the field? Where did you study? How did you spend your time at Stanford? How it may have influenced you? And what are you doing now? Brian, over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Karen, uh, Dr. Eggleston. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you all for inviting me. I'd like to, first of all, thank um, Stanford's uh, Shorenstein A Park for uh, sponsoring me as a postdoc from 2010 to 2011. It was, as many people might remember, it was a couple years after um, a great, the Great Recession of 2008, and so it was a great opportunity to be at Stanford again to kind of regroup and to, to reflect and consolidate my research um, uh, to move to the next step. So it was a critical step in my career. So how did I get here and um, how did um, Stanford's uh, Shorenstein A Park Center help me get here? Uh, in a nutshell, I was always interested in healthcare. I come from a family where a lot of my family members are in healthcare, either as doctors or healthcare administrators. And I also taught at Kaohsiung Medical University for a couple of years. And I decided to go back uh, to uh, get my PhD. And that was at the University of California, Berkeley campus, at the Haas School of Business and Business and Public Policy. And what led me there was that while I was working in Taiwan at the hospital, I noticed that a lot of doctors would simply 
um, give a lot of drugs <laughs> to treat every ailment um, in Taiwan. And I remember when I was a kid and I got off a plane in the US and then I, I, I had an, a terrible earache. My mom took me to the emergency room and after waiting for three hours, the doctor sent me home with this advice that I should go home and rest and drink a lot of water. And that really sparked a, a question in my mind and sort of launched me on my research career. Why, why is healthcare so different in different countries in, in the Asia Pacific region? So that led to my PhD, which I complete, completed under uh, Dr. Paul Gertler at uh, the University of, South, uh, University of California at Berkeley. And that sort of uh, launched the rest of my career uh, in, in terms of my interest in looking at how financial and legal incentives affect the delivery of healthcare um, in the United States, in Asia, and how that affects healthcare and health outcomes afterwards. So again, I'd like to um, mark this occasion. Thank you for inviting me. Um, congratulate A Park on its 40th anniversary. And thank you for the opportunity to, uh, that it's given me um, all these years um, and uh, which led to my current position as an associate professor at the University of South Carolina, continuing my research in healthcare policy around the world. Thank you. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, Sam, would you like to tell us? Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Karen, um, for your kind introductions and also for the opportunity to kind of uh, join this uh, very, very exciting um, webinar. I feel like, um, um, you know, um, it's a family reunion after several years being away from Stanford. And um, I'd love to see all the faces. Um, I, I very much um, um, uh, look forward to seeing you uh, in person in some time soon in, uh, in the near future um, for kind of reconnect our network and um, probably bring in more power to, to change the, um, you know, the health policy in Asia. Um, as um, Karen mentioned, um, I was born and raised in Cambodia, um, receiving uh, my medical doctor degree uh, um, from the University of Health Sciences. But I did very, very little um, clinical work. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity to kind of travel around the country up to, um, you know, my medical school graduation, seeing um, the hardship of um, medical um, professional, the populations in reaching to healthcare. And that's the opportunity for me to um, kind of like uh, think more about the role of public health and health system which I, I hated the most when I was in medical school. And then um, I got an opportunity to, uh, to uh, study in Tokyo. Um, uh, I did um, kind of like, um, I started from, from nothing. I mean, I had, I had no zero experience in research before uh, going to Tokyo. So I was, um, had, I, I was uh, kind of like um, um, provided an um, opportunity to stay there at the University of Tokyo as a research student before uh, entering master degrees. And then um, I, I started to love um, kind of research. Um, and again, I still, I was still a very much um, academic, I would call it uh, academic research, thinking mostly only about kind of getting data and published papers. That, that would be my goal. And then then um, I had the opportunity to, to join Stanford in the Asia Health Policies, um, questioning myself, where is and that's something that that uh, that would be um, the place for me because I I, I thought I I, really, I didn't really do kind of like uh, health policy work. So how can I fit in in the program? And I gotta admit that um, in the first in the year the the, the time that was there I was not very uh, productive. And it was the opportunity to learn and then, um, you know, exposures to um, and, and learn from learning from um, health policy expert and practitioners um, changed my mind. And I think I can do even more uh, linking my background as a, a, an epidemiologist to health policies. And I, I could find a way to, to translate um, health finding, um, finding from my research um, um, into uh, to, uh, to impact the policies and actions. And I think um, that opportunity brought me to where I am today. And um, I spent a little bit more time, a few years in Australia, before uh, deciding to, um, to go to Cambodia for a few years, starting up a research center there. 
called Canada Center for Population Health Research, which I run until uh, I run until now. And um, then I, I think um, now I am based in Asia, and I can do more um, and, and bring more impact um, to um, the Asia health policies by you know conducting community based. Um, I would call my research program now a little bit far away from infectious disease, um, where I was trained in school. So I, and now I'm, in, I'm more into um, the area of implementation research, I'm trying to develop, evaluate, and, and translate uh, research finding into, into policy. We, we are now working on quite a number of projects, which I would um, probably, uh, if you have time, I can introduce some to you um, in the latest um, uh, um, before giving an opportunity to uh, speak and share the experience as well. I'd love to hear from you. Back to you, uh, Karen. Great. Thank you, Sian. Uh, Maggie, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great reunion, really. I, I know we never really overlap, but I met some of you or, or have heard of you one way or another. So it's really wonderful. And it's great to see you, Karen. And uh, I wanted to thank you for, for this opportunity and also uh, to APART for, for extending this opportunity. I uh, started out um, at APARC in 2013 as the Asia Health Policy Postdoctoral Fellow, uh, right after my PhD in public policy at the University of Chicago. So it was an interesting experience and, and it was amazing, right? Because uh, my degree is in public policy. And so there's a little bit of this interdisciplinary component already. And being at the center really, really gave me this wonderful opportunity to connect with researchers those based at Stanford and, and also the many, many visitors. Uh, I started some papers while I was there. So basically people I've met have become co-authors, mentors, and most importantly, friends. And, and, and this is something I really value. And I think to this day, I still think about my experience as sort of, look, uh, my, my training as, as an economist will sort of direct me to, to think about it a certain way, but there may be unintended consequences and there's this different perspective that I think people from other disciplines can bring in. And that's so important. I ended up staying in academia for a few years after uh, my, my postdoc. And um, while doing policy outreach, it's really, really helpful when you're able to sort of listen to what the other stakeholders have to say to really try to get your research be translated into policy. So when I decided to leave academia and, and do policy research, this has really served me, I think, even more um, in terms of working in, in an interdisciplinary team and also um, really making that link between research and policy. And sadly, sometimes the unintended consequences of policies, right? That um, it might not be a health policy per se, but there are implications for health through channels like air pollution, or, or water pollution and, and various things that we know that are also interconnected. So um, that's how I ended up here as an economist at, at the World Bank. And I now support South Asia, a little bit different from East Asia and, and Southeast Asia, um, but there are certainly parallels. And, and I think that really helps me think about what some of the challenges that are similar and, and also the specific South Asian context. Let me stop there. Great. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Over to you. Great. So first, uh, thank you so much, Karen and everyone. And I'm so happy to be part of this celebration because Asia Health Policy Program, Shore and Sign, APOC, really play a vital role in my career. As Karen introduced, basically, I'm a medical doctor from a poor country like Myanmar. So at the beginning of my career, I work as an assistant surgeon and I have absolutely no idea what health policy is, what health system is. And then we had to face a lot of adversities in my country as a surgeon, like we don't have enough resources. I had to do extra shifts because we have limited manpower. I had no knowledge of what is happening to me or to the health system as a whole. 
So in 2014, I came to APOC, Asia Health Policy Program as a visiting scholar, and I started studying health systems and policies. Only then I got a very good idea that everything is linked to the leadership and how policies are made in my country. So I found health policy very fascinating, thanks to Karen, thank you. And then I continue working on health policy studies, especially Asia health policy. So there are a lot of research I have done. Some of them are not published, but I am pretty much believe that I contributed a lot of uh, outputs into my country back because as, at that time I was directly working with the deputy minister for health and Myanmar is under the democratization process so things are very positive and progressive when I was at Stanford and then this experience at APOC actually made me change the direction of my whole career and I decided that I will pursue how to make policies more in-depth. So as soon as I finished my study at APOC, I went to Oxford, United Kingdom, and continue my master's degree in public policy at the Vlaveni School of Government, because I do believe that we have to understand how to make effective policy, especially in a country like Myanmar. So I finished my master's degree in public policy in 2018, and I went back to my country and I work at the Ministry of Health directly under the, the minister himself. And then I contributed to the tax under the National Health Plan Implementation Unit. But as you noticed, due to the enforcing circumstances, I had to leave my country again and now I'm working as a lecturer at the School of Public Health, Lee Cushion Faculty of Medicine, Hong Kong University. So, but stay, my experiences at APOC continue helping me to grow as a person because my primary course at School of Public Health in Hong Kong University is health systems and financing. So I'm so much enjoying to deliver this course because I can integrate a lot of my own experience in my country, as, as well as from other experience from Oxford and Stanford. So I think I'm enjoying my teaching job here a lot, and I'm so much happy uh, to communicate with my international students who are from like Korea, China, uh, Philippines, etc. So I believe that I am still doing something meaningful, even though I had to leave my country and to be away uh, from trouble, but still I believe that um, everything will make sense in the end. And I always notice the importance of Asia Health Policy Program at Shore and Strong APAC, how it make me to become the person I am now. So thank you, Karen. Thank you, Fifu. And last but not least, Vasin, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Professor Karen, for the opportunity to talk about it here and to celebrate the APAC uh, for this year anniversary. So actually, my background is that um, I was born in the, actually, same as Dr. Brian, which is everyone in, her, in the family is the doctors. And actually during the, I think the, the times that when I interest in health policy is during my last year as a medical student, when um, we were sent to work in the rural area instead from, from Bangkok in the capital city. Although at that time, I understand that in Thailand, we have like uh, some kinds of health insurance, like the use of health coverage, but in which all basic healthcare costs were covered by the government, but there's still multiple problems such as the access to care or the continuity of treatment in which the patient cannot, cannot like I cannot go to hospitals or cannot follow up their diabetes treatment, something like that. In which at that time, I think that there's still some, not some problem, but there's still a, a large, a large problem in the healthcare system in, in which I think I'm very, I'm, first come to interest in health policies, uh, how to fix that problem. And 
Therefore, I applied for as a research assistant in the Department of Preventive and Social Medicine in Faculty of Medicine, Jualungkorn University. So during my time as a research assistant, actually, I'm still have a doubt whether I would go on to be a clinician full time or working as a researcher. But I have a great opportunity to visit a park in autumn 2019, in which I think it is the pivot point, a breaking point in my career to choose researcher as a part of being a clinician. So during that time, I visit a park. I have broadened my perspective and exposed to multiple experts in the field. We have discussed how to improve the health health policy, not not just the health policy, but I think more on the health system, how to make the health system better. And and I have I think I have broadened my ideas from connecting with others researchers across the Asia, like in China, and also with um, some researchers in Korea, in which we discuss about our health system and how to improve that. So furthermore, during that time in APAC, I also have a chance to work on the cost effectiveness analysis with the Department of Surgery in Stanford University focusing on refractive fixation. I think during my time in APAC, it is the, like a, the breaking point of my career to choose the research, research pathway instead of um, being a clinician. However, during COVID, I was put into the hospital team to work during that time, like managing the patient or working in the vaccine as a vaccine coordinator. So now I'm, I think my work is more on the management side and I still have some time working on the research, focusing on the um, evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasan, and thank you all for that pre-synopsis of all your time and journey to, to date. So we don't have time to look at all the wonderful things that you all have been doing, but I would invite you, I really am in awe of what many of our emerging scholars are doing to provide evidence for policy throughout the region. Um, but if you could each just share with us briefly a little bit about what you're most excited about, what you're working on now regarding policy in the Asia Pacific, that would be great. So Brian? Would you like to go first? I just wanted to add one thing before launching into what I'm doing right now. I just wanted to mention how important APARC was to me in the sense that I was able to meet so many great scholars there. And uh, one thing of note was that my first publication came out of my work uh, with APARC uh, rather than my own dissertation that took five more years to get published. Um, so thank you very much for that launch again in my career. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that I'm really interested in how I can combine my law degree and um, my uh, economics degree, uh, business and public policy, and do something that's interesting and helpful and meaningful, rather than just um, being another lawyer that I could have chosen as a career path. So just uh, like the last speaker, I do want to mention that um, my experience as a part actually set me on this course where I had a divergent path that I could have gone to law school, I could have gone to business school, but I chose health policy. And I, I never regretted that dec decision. It's meaningful and it's, um, it's, it's the kind of job where I feel like I can make some sort of contribution. And to that effect, what I'm working on right now is um, just going back to my roots um, in looking at how physicians prescribe drugs. And this is not a specific, and in fact, it probably doesn't apply to the Asia um, arena. So I have other studies I do want to talk about. But what I'm working on currently is looking at how state laws that limit um, opioid prescriptions affect um, physicians um, prescribing behavior in terms of perioperative opioid um, prescription. Specifically, um, everyone knows that in the U.S. we have a hugely, um, a huge challenge with opioid ad uh, addiction. Um, it's called the opioid crisis or epidemic. And throughout the years, health policymakers and lawyers and, and law um, uh, makers tried to address the problem by throwing everything um, at the problem, uh, including many, many different policies that we don't know if they work or not. And so in particular, there's one law that I am interested in looking at is the um, state 
opioid supply limitation laws. They basically took the CDC guidelines and said, in most circumstances, you don't need more than three day supplies of opioids. And so they codified that into law um, and basically said, physicians, you can only um, prescribe three days or seven days. And there, there are all these variations across states. So I'm looking at how these variations are associated with um, the amount of opioids prescribed um, around surgery and whether or not that has a downstream health outcome impact on the, that um, based on those decisions. And so I'm using an instrumental variable technique. The outcomes are not there yet, but I have my first stage outcome, which is to look at whether or not there's um, an association between the laws and opioids prescribed. And so far I can confirm that in states with more limitations or um, a more strict um, um, guideline, physicians tend to um, prescribe lower MMEs, that's morphine uh, milligram equivalents of opioids. And so I'm gonna take that variation across states and do a second stage re um, regression to look at whether or not that variation is associated with um, downstream opioid misuse um, or opioid use disorder diagnoses, as well as um, whether or not that's associated with more visits to, to the pain clinic. Um, if physicians underprescribe um, at around surgery, then we might see that. Um, so um, a, a nod to Margaret and her work on unintended consequences. Um, this is a huge field with a lot of questions and a, a very important, uh, challenging uh, public health crisis. Um, we don't know what the answer is, um, and we're trying everything. And I'm, interesting, I'm interested in seeing whether or not what we're trying actually um, achieves its intended consequences or whether or not it also has unintended consequences. So that is my U.S focus work right now, but in terms of my Asia focus work, I'm proud to say that many of them are actually co-authored with uh, Dr. Eggleston. Karen, thank you for your guidance. Even after um, the postdoc experience I've had, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about one or two if I have time to do that. Uh, in particular, the last paper to come out um, jointly with um, Karen and uh, Toshi uh, Toshiaki, right? Izuka at the University of Tokyo. Uh, it's called um, uh, basically whether or not is preventive medicine worth it the cost. And so in this work, what we did was that we took um, data set of um, employees in Japan who have ma mandatory checkups. And so um, for diabetes. And we looked at whether or not people who came in just under the threshold and just above the threshold to be considered diabetic or pre-diabetic, whether, whether or not that changed uh, healthcare behavior and subsequently whether or not that changed health outcomes. And um, using a technique called regression discontinuity, we considered the people who are just around the threshold to be relatively similar. It's just that they were randomly above or below the threshold. And so we looked at whether or not being above the threshold had any effect. And we found that in the general population in Japan, uh, that being above the signal uh, was associated with greater utilization of healthcare, but not better health. However, we dug a little deeper and looked at whether or not uh, a subgroup of the people who were considered um, high-risk individuals. And we found that there is some net positive financial and health benefit for these high-risk individuals. So that was a very interesting study that I had the pleasure of working with Karen and, and Toshi on. And one more study that I just want to highlight, which I just feel is really interesting for policy research is looking at microsimulation. Uh, and this time we move over to Japan and we use um, a state transition microsimulation model to basically project what Japan's population will look like in, in 40 to 60 years. Um, as everyone knows that aging is a very important um, challenge in Japan. It's a super aging society. Uh, where the average age is really high and it's only growing older. 
Um, so we use these micro simulation techniques to project the population uh, into the future. And specifically, we looked at whether or not um, there would be a higher burden of morbidity in Japan. And uh, the upshot is that, unfortunately, there's going to be a high prevalence of people with um, uh, various measures of disability, and that it's not because of a um, higher prevalence of disease, it's because of aging. And um, I well, would love to open that to the policymakers to see if there's any policy prescription for that. But that's something that's really interesting that I've been working on as well. Um, if you allow me one more minute, I just want to complete the circle by talking about my dissertation that actually was finally published five years after I graduated uh, in the Journal of Public Economics. And that goes back to my roots again, where uh, the, the spark, so to speak, was the fact that I realized that there were very different prescribing patterns in, in Asia and the United States where there's a preference for prescribing something for everything in Asia, and what are the impact, uh, health, con health consequences of that kind of practice. And so um, moving over to Taiwan, what we did was that we took data from Taiwan's National Health Insurance Bureau and um, looked at the effect of something we call the separating policy uh, that occurred sometime um, in the late 1990s in Taiwan that prohibited doctors from prescribing and selling the drugs from their own clinics. And the upshot was that we found that if the doctors were prohibited from selling drugs from their own clinics, they do drop their prescription rates. However, that there was some loophole in the law, talking again about unintended consequences, um, bowing to societal pressure and protests the Taiwanese government allowed a, uh, a workaround that if you hired an on-site pharmacist, then you can continue to dispense drugs from your clinics. And guess what? Everyone uh, that could afford to hired an on-site pharmacist and their prescription rates went right back up. And we also found that these changes in prescription rates didn't affect health outcomes, at least not observable ones. So those are some of the, um, the manuscripts I've worked on over the years. And again, it was a pleasure to have um, Karen's guidance on, on many of them. And while I do have an increasing focus on US health policy, given my position at the University of South Carolina and this emphasis on getting NIH funding, which emphasizes US focused questions, uh, but I never forget my, my, my um, APARC roots and uh, in, in my non-funded work, I really enjoy working on Asia-focused um, policy questions. Uh, thank you very much for that opportunity to share my work. Thank you, Brian. I, I do have great faith that we can learn a lot from doing comparative work and working in multiple institutional settings. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, so Slayton, can you share a little bit about your current exciting research? Thanks, thank, um, Corinne, and thank uh, Brian for sharing uh, your research work. Um, I think uh, my work is a bit um, at the different court news, um, but again, we try to kind of um, influence the policies as well. Um, um, thanks to my opportunity at the, uh, at the US National University of Singapore, um, I'm part of the uh, Global Health Office. Um, so um, here, I lead um, a program called Inter Integrated Research Program, aiming to support and expand our collaboration in um, low and middle income country, particularly in uh, Southeast Asia. We have an office in Cambodia, um, um, started um, several years ago, and um, we just launched a new uh, office in Laos. Actually, we plan to go to Myanmar to Cambodia, but because of the political um, stability um, we, we decided to start Laos and we will consider Myanmar later on. The next country would be the Philippines or Indonesia, Timor Leste. So um, here, as I think I am in a, a, a position to kind of like, uh, you know, um, work together with, um, with communities and, and, and uh, stakeholders, policymakers, and funders to really change and uh, impact um, health system and policy in, in these uh, developing countries. 
example of our work uh, include um, randomized control trials, mostly community-based, um, aiming to um, develop um, evaluate and, um, and um, kind of translated um, finding from community-based interventions uh, studies into policies. For example, um, we are now receiving funding from, from Gates Foundation to develop a community-based intervention using a mobile application and web-based application to support and link community-based health workers to primary health care center um, in, in the support to ensure that pregnant women, uh, newborn babies um, would receive um, the services they are supposed to do. So it, it just, it's starting now. Another project we are, which are, we are now um, um, concluding is the, um, all again on uh, uh, digital health technologies. We use um, a kind of mobile platform to provide um, education and um, information to female entertainment workers um, through um, their uh, smartphone and then um, we try to um, connect them, link them to uh, the so-called outreach workers, which are uh, their peer in the communities, so that they can seek for help when they need, um, for example, um, you know, when they need um, to, to go for HIV testing or when they suffer from uh, gender-based violence in the, the workplace, they can always um, contact the workers, uh, the community health workers, and then um, and, and maybe link further to health facilities. So these are kind of examples of our work and we have done the same um, in, in different areas. Um, so that's why I'm kind of now getting away from kind of disease specific research to a more kind of health system and um, um, implementation research. Um, we, 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 are, we have worked um, similarly in, in other areas for example, um, we have um, developed different uh, models and approaches working directly with the community um, stakeholders in the countries to develop, um, we call it like um, um, active case finding um, to improve um, kind of case detection, TB case detection um, in, in Cambodia and other countries and the region. We are now trying to kind of like adapt and replicate these uh, models into different countries. Other areas um, that we are now working on um, is um, something around the uh, development of infection, uh, kind of the effective model to control a hospital acquired infection through, we call it IPC, like infection prevention control model. We are now uh, piloting the model in Cambodia and Laos, hoping to also bring it out to, to Myanmar and the Philippines in the future. Um, so these are um, example of work, and uh, we, we we try to. So I, I think um, we have been very proud of what we have done because um, of the opportunities um, that that um, we have um, uh, kind of established network collaboration with um, people in the region. Particularly, so we work very closely with uh, the community, um, different um, kind of. Um, levels of, of stakeholders, um, funding agency, development partners. So we involve them from the big, from, from, from A to Z. Um, you know, we invite uh, the communities, stakeholders, um, funder to discuss together and design the intervention, evaluation and, uh, and, uh, and dissemination of the funding. And, and, and that way, uh, we can kind of directly um, impact the policy. So usually we, we start the um, kind of research project and proposal uh, looking for funding, explaining the, the, the community and stakeholders that, um, um, hey, let's do this together and we will look for money and then so we can do it together. And that way we can, we can kind of like in the end, um, we can uh, ensure the ownership uh, within the communities and stakeholders. And in the end, um, our, our finding would be directly translated into policies in the countries. We have also done um, um, quite a bit of work in the regions. For example, um, recently, um, my team um, has, has been working with, um, with Vipro and other partners um, in, in, in the region to um, 
kind of examine um, to review the um, the health policies um, in in uh, many countries in the in Asia and in, in, in the Pacific in the prevention control and and uh, kind of uh, providing care um, services to um, older populations um, with TB. And um, we are now working on it. And uh, these are uh, kind of like um, more uh, you know, kind of the work that I have done uh, and closer to uh, kind of expanding uh, my collaboration in the region. Um, we are also currently, um, again, so I'm getting back to my kind of portfolios at, 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 the, at NUS. It's my role is not only to do research, but um, we also aim to improve or, or build the capacities of um, um, healthcare professional and um, 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 health, uh, public health uh, education um, system in the region as well. Um, so that's why I usually tell people that I'm not sure I'm, I, I still, I'm still a researcher because I do a kind of different thing, uh, different area with different uh, uh, populations and, and partners. I now am now working, uh, not, not, I mean, I would call my, my team um, at an NGS in Cambodia, Laos, the Philippines, we are now working with, um, with uh, ADB and uh, ANU, the national, uh, the Australian National University to develop a kind of training module to support primary healthcare workers and community workers um, uh, around uh, the area of um, kind of um, um, supporting um, the government in those countries in their um, uh, COVID vaccine rollout. And um, that would also um, uh, improve the immunization uh, system in the countries. I will pause here and uh, happy to come back if, if there is any questions. Thanks so much, Karen. Over back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Sam, for sharing that exciting work. So um, Maggie, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you're working with the bank these days. Sure. Um, well, I've left academia, so uh, the work is much more grounded in policy questions, uh, which is really, really fascinating. I've always been interested in health as human capital, and so thinking about how that relates to other domains. So I've been very, very fortunate to be able to continue to work in the space. Um, so I started out working on Indonesia, my own home country, thinking about how the conditional cash transfer program could affect the healthcare market. Um, how would the healthcare providers respond uh, when, when we have this new program? And then uh, since leaving academia, I, I now support South Asia. So the, the work is a little bit different, but I think we can all acknowledge that there's this growing environmental challenges. And of course that relates to human capital and in, including health. Um, so I'm very, very fortunate, I think, to be able to uh, be a part of this team that, that really tries to contribute to this policy discussion. So one of the things that we recently launched is uh, this regional air pollution report. And this is one of the things where it's so important to think about the context, uh, because when we think about air pollution, you know, one of the first things that, that would come to mind is the energy sector, the transportation sector. Uh, but when we look at the data coming from South Asia, some modeling, some, some analysis that, that we did, actually it, it shows that biomass uh, burning from, from cooking is one of the top contributors. So when we're thinking about the impact on health, it became even clearer. And when we're thinking about how inclusive uh, the, the growth can be in, in South Asia and when you link it to health, well, women and children are much more likely to be affected by household air pollution. So when we go after this low hanging fruit, but very context specific, um, we could potentially get greater impact. And the other thing that came out of this report is that, you know, we have this uh, national boundaries, but air pollution doesn't care, right? It, it, it travels. Um, and, and so as, as a result of, of this modeling exercise, it became very, very clear that some of the air sheds uh, where you can really target these interventions in, in, in high pollution areas, it really needs to have uh, this uh, cross-border, uh, more of a regional coordination. So it's no longer a national issue, 
but much more of a regional issue. And so this is the part, you know, yeah, it's great to have findings, but how do you actually implement that? One of the things that became very, very apparent is the need to really consult with stakeholders, making sure that there's good data, making sure that there's monitoring in place, meaning investing in these things. Um, and ultimately, we go back to economic theory, right? What could work? What kinds of incentives could be built in? Um, and also thinking a little bit about how that could impact people, right? And 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 the heterogeneity is also potentially very, very important um, because a policy that works for, for the rich may simply not work for the poor. In fact, it could potentially harm them. So, so this is one of the things that we want to think about and, and sort of try to mitigate upfront. Uh, this is ongoing work. Um, my colleagues are very, very busy working with clients and partners on, on the ground. Um, so we'll, we'll see how the next steps are. Um, but hopefully, you know, I, I think there's a lot of awareness um, and, and I'm hopeful that this is one of the things that we can do to really try to build more of a resilient uh, community. So let me stop there. Thank you, Maggie, for sharing that and highlighting the important work in environment and health and community building. One of the developments since any of you were at Stanford is that Stanford went ahead and launched a new school focused on sustainability. So we at APARC are also trying to educate ourselves and reach out more and support those in the region working on this important issue of environment and sustainability. So thank you. Uh, next, please, a few of you, if you could share some. I know you didn't have opportunity to cover everything. I know you're working as a steering committee of the Science in Exile Initiative. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. You. Yes, uh, thank you. So before actually I shared about the Science in Exile initiative, I also would like to remind you the little impact that we made in 2014-15. So at that time at APOC, under your guidance, I was studying the health system transformation in Myanmar and especially disparities in health and healthcare in Myanmar. So Karen, if you could remember, we were able to bring one of the director of National Health Plan Implementation Unit as our co-author, and we published our little co correspondence in Lancet. And then I would like to quote, because it's always something I'm proud of. We said, conventional budget allocation, time to population and infrastructure gives disproportionately more resources to regions with better health and fewer resources to several states with high health needs, such as maternal mortality. This little co correspondence had a very huge impact afterwards because I got to know that the Minister for Health himself has read it. And then I also got to talk to one of the directors of the National Health Plan Implementation Unit in 2016, I guess. And then very happy to note that the states that we highlighted, such as Chin State, got increased health budget. I don't I, did, I didn't claim that that is because of our correspondence, but that might be something, maybe little, little contribute, contribution to this kind of policy change. So I would like to highlight this, our research in this 40th anniversary of uh, Asia Health Policy APOC. And thank you, Karen. And it was really a very, very positive and progressive time for us. But as we all noticed, very unfortunately, the Myanmar military violently took over the country again in 2021. And that's why I ended working as a member of the uh, Science and XI initiatives. So the, I am one of the steering committee member. So Science and XI initiatives was led by the UNESCO and it aims to bring together at risk displaced and refugee scientists, along with other like-minded organizations, especially to protect scientists and medical doctors, not only from Myanmar, but also from Tigray region of Ethiopia, also from protracted crisis in countries like Afghanistan, South Sudan, Syria, Venezuela, Yemen, etc. Because after the coup, a lot of medical doctors and scientists in Myanmar stand very firm against the junta. And then 
the impact or the, the reaction from the home is also very violent. For example, there are 671 incidents of the violence against healthcare in Myanmar. Also, there are 750 health workers being arrested right now, and at least 56 health workers are being killed. So it is a kind of very devastating situation for me personally and for also the country. And then no matter what we did in the past, everything is like literally collapsed. I would argue that Myanmar health systems is collapsed due to COVID is pandemic and also the coup. So I could predict that there will be a lot of human resource crisis in the near future. And I really wish that I could do some research on that, but things are not that clear. Like uh, our previous colleague mentioned, a lot of research work from Myanmar are now uh, stopped or like halted for several reasons. And I myself couldn't do much for my country. Despite that, I'm trying to, um, um, highlight the consequences of the military coup on local, regional, and global health through webinars and talks. So, and then as a member of the Science and XI initiatives, I trying to highlight the emergencies, not only Myanmar, as also for other scientists in crisis across the globe. And then I have learned that we don't have any special mechanism in place to save such kind of scientists all over the world. This finding also shocked me to the core and I'm looking forward to ways how I could contribute more to those in exile. So actually I am very much unhappy to tell you that I'm not working on any research because I cannot do much at the time being, but I'm a lecturer in higher education right now. So what I can do is I teach health systems and policies to some international students. And in this case, I'm not focusing on policymakers anymore. My focus becomes my students, which are coming from different country. And I would say that uh, these young people are also very important to bring demographic changes to Southeast Asia and across the world. So I try my best to share my personal experiences with my students and also highlight the importance of the leadership and health policy, especially to achieve better health outcomes, especially for vulnerable populations and communities around the world. So that's very short, but I, I would say that that is all from me, all from me right now, but I'm trying my best what I can do more to contribute in the policy area as, a, as an alumni of Asia Health Policy Program, EPARC. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Fufu, and thank you for all that you do. There's so many challenges out there and any one of us is limited, but if we all work together, we can try to address some of these big challenges and especially linking to young people, as you highlighted, We'll come to back to that at the end, but first, can we please hear from Boston? Maybe you can share some of your current research with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Karen. So I would divide my current work into two parts. The first one is focused on the hospital side in which um, I act as the, I work for the data management center. So our focus because due to my hospital is a teaching hospital. So in the past, we didn't care much about the cost. So the testing we have, I would I would not say unnecessary test, but like a lot of testing and that may not yield to patient outcome. So currently now we work on how to capture the unnecessary test while maintaining the quality of care of the patients. So actually we already diagnosed which disease group that is our priorities, but now we are currently work with the physician in that domain to identify and this actually design how, how we can reduce some tests while maintaining the patient quality of care and discuss with the, which outcome that matters to the patient and to the providers, not just like the, the test result come back as normal or abnormal, something like that. So that's from my hospital side. And for the current research, um, actually during my time at APAC, I, we work on the pilot project on the diabetes effective, effective coverage of the diabetes patient while, by using the 
we have a survey, a national health exam survey in Thailand, and we map that for using the data from the National Health Security Office, which give us the health utilization of, of, of the public side, of the public side utilization in the country. So when we map that, we found that like uh, there's still limitation into accessing to other people can get their screening. We have the diabetes screening for the general population, but for when the result come back as positive or maybe a little bit high blood sugar, the people actually did not go to confirm their diagnosis in the hospital. So this is that is our and that's a project that I work on in APAC and um why I come back to Thailand. Now we we are working on I think the similar project, but we broaden the scope by, by using the um national health database, which um the survey maybe consists around 10,000 patients. But now we, we expand it. We just receive the data and we expand it to like millions of people to identify whether we, we see this pattern in not just the survey and also in the um in our current ecosystem or not. Because actually we we find some discrepancy between the aggregate data that the government published as the health indicators and our survey. So now we are we just received the data and I'm very excited to see whether. Is there any discrepancy or not? Or it just like the survey that we first pilot on is may, may not be generalizable to the general population. Lastly, I think one thing that I would like to highlight is about the, the importance of the evidence-based policies. So I have a chance to evaluate a downing prevention program in for the child downing prevention program in Thailand. So for some information. Actually, in 2008, we we have like a, a lot of child death due to dying in Thailand. So the government like uh, they issue some policies such as teaching swimming to the child, having education to the parents, and also with the teachers in the what's called in the school, and also building like the fences and highlight the high risk area in the communities. During that time, actually, we saw saw like a significant drop of the drowning death in child between. 2008 and 2015. However, um, from the analysis during that time, they also found that the child in the younger age, like age two to five, which in which um the, the, those child group may not be targeted by the importance by by some of the policies like the swimming, which we teach the child age six year and above. So they launched a program about the a comprehensive program covered child prevention downing based on the WHO guidelines um, for all child age group, which ran during 2015 until the present. So I have a chance to evaluate the program, but um, from the preliminary result, it showed that um, the program may not that effective um, based on the analysis using the vital statistic data. So I think it's very important to Find that even though some logic that we think that it, it would gonna it will work, but sometimes the analysis come back as different. So now um, we currently try to um what's called to to describe or discuss whether why the program is, is not working. Is it because of the implementation of the program or some other factors? Thank you very much. Quite a wide range of issues you're working on there for policy in Thailand. Well, thank you all for sharing so much about your current research. I know there's much more you could share with us, but you're busy and our audience also as time is limited. So I thought I would wrap it up with a final round of questions for each of you to try to, despite all the challenges we face, to try to end on a very optimistic note, um, especially for young people, as several of you mentioned about what you're working on and how that is related to emerging scholars and youth in our region. And that's and their relationship to the future of our world. Uh, maybe you could stay a little bit about your views now from your current perspective. Why might young people consider working in our field? Why is that so important? What makes you optimistic about the future of evidence-based health policy despite all the challenges we face? So Brian, would you like to first address some of that? I was thinking about this question and I think the answer lies right in front of my eyes sometimes with all the students I have, um, particularly the doctoral students that I'm, um, I am have the honor and privilege of directing their dissertation. They all come to me 
um, because they want to know the answer to the question they posed. Um, they're very excited about their work in terms of what kind of policy impact it might have on, on the people they care about, on the issues they care about. And in the past, I've had experience where, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes uh, students, some students do want to just get a degree, but they're in the minority. And what I see really um, are the students who come to me. I have a student currently who is already working in the field and his research is inspired by what he sees in the field. Um, he's very interested in um, HIV policy in South Carolina. Um, and he's really concerned about the health disparities um, associated with the disease that uh, African-Americans, for example, un, uh, disproportionately are the, the group affected by HIV, new HIV infection. And he wants to know um, what he can do and what his research question can bring to the table to, to influence policy. And I have another student who's actually from Thailand and she worked really, really hard. And um, she um, was very interested in the disparities in Thailand uh, in terms of the access to, to dental uh, care, uh, that there's a high concentration of dentists in, in Bangkok, but very um, limited access in the rural areas of, of Thailand. And she, she worked really, really hard. She had such a difficult time because of language problems as well, but also um, overcoming other challenges. But she, she forged on and she, she got her paper published in uh, Health Policy and Planning. And um, I have yet another student who's really interested in looking at what uh, can state laws and, uh, do to address um, uh, the opioid epidemic, actually. Uh, in terms of allowing more direct access to physical therapists. So what I'm optimistic about is that despite all the challenges, you know, some students want to get by, <laughs> uh, but the, the majority of my students, they just come in and, and they want to study a question that has personal meaning to them um, to be able to take their findings and influence policy in the various issues and the wide-ranging issues that I see that we face today um, in terms of healthcare policy. And so they're, they're the future. And I think I, if you're one of those people, you're interested in making a difference by sharing and providing evidence-based um, policy recommendation. Um, health policy is certainly one way you can do it. And what I'm also impressed and in terms of young people, I, I, I'm always going first because I'm the oldest here in terms of the A Park. Uh, so I've been inspired by, by the rest of you guys um, that you have taken various routes, um, not just the academic route, uh, just how we are able to come together and provide different pieces of the puzzle to make change. Uh, from Margaret, who, who's actually doing um, policy research, uh, to Fiu Fiu, I hope I'm not mispronouncing everyone's, everyone's name, uh, to sharing her concerns about um, the present situation in, in, in Myanmar um, and the clinicians on, the on, on this panel as well, uh, making change through the medical care as well as research um, that informs their medical care. So I'm very optimistic um, just from this panel alone, but also by my students and what I see in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. So, Ian, would you like to share your thoughts? Thank you. Um, well, I, um, you know, coming back to uh, my role at, at NUS, um, being the um, director of the integrated research program, although there is um, the word research in the program, but um, we aim to also kind of uh, support um, our partners and, and countries um, in, in the region to kind of like to grow in their in the areas of public health, education and practice as well on top of the research, which is my personal kind of priorities and interests. So um, I kind of like um, ask myself, it is um, I have done kind of meaningfully in my career, uh, researchers and uh, public health, global health um, uh, uh, researchers and educators. And, and then my role is to kind of also inspire the next generation to think more about, about uh, public health and health system, health policy, 
um, in their countries. And country like Cambodia, because I'm originally from Cambodia, I still have a very strong kind of attachment with um, my colleagues in Cambodia, student there, I teach a lot um, in Cambodia and Laos. Actually, some of my teaching hours in those countries as a volunteer is more than, uh, uh, the, a lot more than the dot I, I, that I teach in, in, in NUS these days. So, um, you know, in Cambodia and, uh, and, and Laos, um, the, um, I already see the same question. Why you quit your career as a doctor, as a medical doctor, and to do um, your research and um, how you, you contribute um, to the health um, through your career. It's a pressure to me. I have to prove that I've done the right thing and I, I, I have done a kind of meaningful work and um, I have to prove them that um, you know, I mean, not only, you know, the contribution to, to the areas, but it's also um, the kind of job securities, um, particularly for students, they will think about that. Where's the market of public health? What I can do after I get a degree? What I can do if I, I, I do global health, for example? So I got to kind of like prove them that there's a market there, there's work to do. It, it's not a kind of fortunate thing um, to have COVID, but I could see um, a lot of kind of changes in the mindsets of people there. We can, um, you know, medical doctors, uh, medical students started to see more, you know, the bright side of, of public health. And um, again, I, I repeat, I hated public health a lot when I was um, in, the, in the medical school. And, uh, and then I started to love it only when I do it. Um, and I, I tried to come tell the student the same. Here at NUS, I teach a global health um, course um, called Health of the Poor in Asia. So we try to kind of bring in a uh, student from a uh, different background, including those without um, health or pub, uh, without medical or public health background to understand what global health is about and how people from different backgrounds can contribute to, to uh, uh, global health and, 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 I, and how global health may impact the life of everyone and how um, the one uh, can play a role um, differently to contribute to the health system and policy in their country. This, kind of, this way, I, I think um, I, have, I have done to some extent to really kind of inspire the next generation and COVID has you know, brought a lot of challenges in the healthcare system, um, particularly in low and middle income country. But at the same time, I could see um, a kind of opportunities growing now um, in terms of, um, you know, um, the passions of people in the region and globally to really come together to think about how, how, how to collaborate as a kind of like, uh, as a, a member of, of the global um, health. How can we work together? So there is a lot of like, I received a lot of like a contact recently from people in the region and globally to see, hey, why don't we write ground together to do this in, in, in these countries? So I, I, so these are, there's opportunity there. So um, collaboration opportunity growing, funding opportunity growing um, because of COVID, I think, and because also of the interest and the kind of like, um, the increased interest in, in global health and the, the, the more understanding of how global health impact everyone on the planet. Thanks so much. Over back to you, um, um, uh, Karen. Thank um, you so much. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. thank you, Soyeon. Yeah, so uh, Maggie, would you like to share some thoughts with us? What makes you optimistic? Thank you, Karen. I think I will be echoing what's been said already in, in terms of, yes, there are challenges, um, there are also opportunities. And I really do see that um, when, you know, through our collaboration with stakeholders, right, researchers like all the academics here, um, you bring this very, very unique perspective, thinking about some of these policy questions critically, going back to theory and, and, and thinking about how is that going to be implemented? What are the potential consequences? Um, and we also have now better data and there's this growing interest uh, among policymakers, right? For evidence-based policy. And so I really do think that uh, there will be more and more interest from the stakeholders and this hopefully will then generate and, and, and sort of grow this interest uh, among young people to, to look into 
more of, I guess, not necessarily policy research, uh, but but also uh, just research in, in, in general and asking critical questions, uh, thinking in some sense uh, as broadly as possible, but asking very specific questions, right? And, and, and I think there's a lot of that going on. And, and so I'm, I'm really quite optimistic. Thank you. If you, what keeps you optimistic despite all the challenges? Yes, thank you. Sure, Karen. So uh, to be honest, I couldn't say that I'm super optimistic because I would talk about being optimistic, but I would like to talk about being optimistic first in brief explanation. Because as you noticed in 2014 and 2015, you and I were working on Myanmar's a transformation and its health system progress. And it was so exciting. People, not only us, there are a lot of people working on Myanmar's health system. And we are we were very hopeful. But then just suddenly everything fell apart so quickly to the ground. And a lot of families, a lot of people's lives are now in crisis. And then that really made me pes pessimistic, I would say. But not totally pessimistic because all of you, all my colleagues just mentioned that the world is not that dark. We are, we still have lights. For example, when I teach my course to my students, my students came from different regions and they are genuinely interested in what is happening in Myanmar, what is happening in Ethiopia, and they want to help those people. So I I, I, I have some doubt about global system in helping each other, to be honest, including United Nations. But putting this aside, I trust in young people empathy and sy sympathy towards unfortunate people like us, like Myanmar. So what I try to teach my students is like that. I teach both medical doctors as well as global health student. So uh, I have an example to give them. Okay, as a medical doctor, if you made a mistake with a patient, only one patient's life will be lost. But when you become a policymaker and make a wrong policy or inequitable policy, millions of lives will be lost. So you have to know the difference between the two. And then you have to emphasize on the vulnerable populations all over the world and the importance of policy, like CN talked about uh, previously, like global health as the humanity, as not Burmese, as not Ethiopian, as not Af Afghanistani or as not American. We have to view all the problems at humanity as humans being, and then try to think about how we should solve this problem together. So, so my students, are really brilliant. And that's why I am, I told you that I enjoy my current job and then feeling rewarding, even though I can't do any research or I can't actually do much for my country. Still, my days look meaningful because of my students. And I'm so much optimistic about the future of mankind, no matter how much things are currently great for my country. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Vossin, would you like to share some parting thoughts with us? Um, thank you very much. So as to echo what everyone has said, I think evidence-based policies can like, a, it is a stepping stone that we can use to discuss with the policymakers. So we will not um, decide anything based on just the belief or the logic behind that, but we have the real evidence to confirm what that we what that what have what what we gonna do and whether it's work or not. So I think the although there are multiple key challenges, but I think the evidence based policy will be like the main main goal, like the main intervention that can improve the health, not just in Thailand or in some space far out of the world, but as globally. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you all so much for sharing your experiences. We really are honored and inspired by all of the work that you and our other scholars are doing. And thank you all, our viewers, for joining us for this reflection in 
uh, honor of the 40th anniversary of APARC. Thank you once again to all of our wonderful panelists and enjoy the rest of your day or your evening. Thank you.